Yeah, at that time, I've, I've fulfilled a number of roles at the CCDC. Uh, my current one is a director of data initiatives, and it's uh, focused on understanding how the CCDC should be continue to be evolving in response to um, expectations of the wider scientific community. Um, but we've been in the business of data for over 55 years. Um, central to what we do is the Cambridge Structural Database. It contains over 1 million small molecule um, organic and metal organic crystal structures. There's an example of what one of those looks like when you, um, it, it's shown on the screen there. Um, we get around 80,000 of these deposited annually. Uh, many of them are linked to journal articles, but an increasing number are actually being published independently as to CSD communications, which is something we've established with an ISS um, to capture data sets that might not otherwise be published. And each of those entries is enriched and annotated by experts at the CCDC. Now, although we get these sort of great 3D models of the structures, in a way, the CCDC shares a lot of similarities to any other repository that might be dealing in sort of data sets um, and the data comes to us in um, you know kind of files which get deposited through our web deposition service. Now we run this jointly with the inorganic crystal structure database which is a sibling database um, and the service allows researchers to upload their structures um, it um, provides opportunity to perform various checks on the data, calling out to sort of community services um, that will check for consistency and completeness. And it provides opportunity for researchers to add additional metadata that, that might be yeah, useful for when it comes to making the data set publicly available. So the core CCDC data activities are all about making data findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable um, by making sure it's published and preserved in standard formats. Um, we assign DOIs to those data sets and make sure there's links between the data and the literature, enriching them so that they can be readily reused and discovered through services that we provide for lookup and download. We also undertake another number of other community activities. We provide resources to support teaching and education, software that enables basic structure visualization and validation and engagement in activities such as this. But we receive no grant funding to support these core activities and this presentation is going to be about how we managed to achieve that. We have to go back to 1965 when the database was established in the University of Cambridge with some essentially seed funding from the Royal Society and shown in the picture there in the centre is Olga Kennard who was the founding executive director of the CCDC. And the main objective of that funding was to assemble a computer-based file of information and data. But the first manifestation of that file was actually in volumes, printed volumes that um, were generated from the computer file, but you had to put on your bookshelf and you'd be able to flick through and look for references in the literature to a structure that you might be um, in, interested in. And there were about 13 or so volumes of those that were published over time. Now, at some undetermined point, but in a story that will be familiar to many, that funding started to dry up and pressure started to be applied for the CCDC to become self-supporting. And two things happened. One is that academics in other regions started to say, well, we've got funds we can make available and we'd be happy to contribute those to support the work of the centre. And that led to the establishing of a network of national affiliated centres um, that serve academic um, users of the CSD in, in those regions, which still exist today. The other thing that happened is that industry started to take an interest and they were willing to contribute funds for the data and importantly for the software that was emerging at that time as well. And then in around um, 1988, uh, the CCDC was established as an independent not-for-profit um, registered charity. And I think by then we had established this sort of um, uh, funding model of um, dual income streams, independent of direct public grants, where the revenue was coming from industry and academia, pri primarily for the value added software and services that CCDC was providing on top of the data. And this shows you what that sort of product portfolio looks like today. Um, the number of different software suites that are targeted at problems relating to the design and optimization of new molecules and um, understanding and predicting the behavior and properties of um, new materials. And these are 
tended to evolve to with input from industry as to specifically the needs that they have primarily from the pharmaceutical industry. So some core user communities here are structural chemists and biologists, medicinal and computational chemists and solid form and crystallization scientists. So in some way a little bit distant from the sort of crystallographers who are generating the data in the first place. So a key role of what we're doing here is enabling that transition from that data into other communities so it can be readily reused. But the academics aren't absent from that. And the tools that we make available to industry, we also make available um, to academia to enable them to do uh, research into structural science and structural chemistry. And there's a number of ways in which we, we do this. One is, comes back to this network of national affiliated centers. And with a number of these now, we have countrywide licenses in place. And the great thing about this is that to the researchers in that particular region, the value added tools are free to them at the point of use, um, having been supported by uh, sort of like a kind of, kind of consolidated um, contribution of funds um, from the affiliated center. Um, you'll get um, uh, the tools made available across campuses, often through university libraries, particularly in North America. There's a strong tradition of chemistry librarians who are used to providing electronic resources to their communities. And then individual researchers and groups can take out a license for use in their lab or for a particular project. We also work hard to make sure that when we're pricing the, using the academic um, licenses that we're sensitive to um, the geographical region. So we have a look at, look at GDP and pricing is often related to that. And for those um, regions where um, you know, there is really not very much research going on, we have a program that provides free access for people to take advantage of those tools. How this then breaks down into the overall funding of the CCDC is that what I've just talked about represents about 30 to 40 percent of the revenue that we get, but 60 to 70 percent of the revenue is coming from industry. Now, the numbers I'm showing here are from 2018 because that's the last time we did sort of a detailed sort of analysis of the sort of breakdown of our revenue. Um, so the pie charts on the side show that 60 to 40 split for the software from industry and academia, but also an increasing other non software revenue, which I'll say a little bit more about later. But when you look at the users of the system, the sort of ratio is inverse, inverse, and we've got far more academic accounts than we have industrial accounts. And when you look at the differential of pricing for industry versus um, academia, it's about a 90% discount for um, academia. Advantages of this is this model has been that we've been able to build reserves up over time to provide funds that might cover the risk of unforeseen circumstances, support various other research activities as well. Um, and you know, with an operating budget, we typically aim to set, set it to break even. Um, as a registered charity, we can't make a profit and any surplus gets reinvested in the organization. And to give you an idea of how this sort of breaks down across the activities in the organization, we have data and science people, software developers and business developer, more skewed towards the data and science who are necessary to support activities across the, um, uh, uh, across the organization. So in terms of what we make available for free and what we sort of charge for, it's all about striking a balance between what, what provides the most sort of wide accessibility um, whilst being able to sort of fund, you know, um, fuel the sustainability model. So this top part here is things we could have done, but we haven't in a way. Um, we don't hold back on making the data available. Um, we get it out there. Often the public services will see the data sooner than the paid for services. Um, the public landing pages are fairly rich. Um, we make sure we've got links through to other data resources. We've got metadata openly available and some free software. The piece we really hold back on is um, the systematic search analysis of the aggregated collection, because that underpins those software solutions that are generating us the revenue um, that, 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 that funds the activities of the organization. And the other piece of value that we've started to introduce in more recent terms is using the expertise in the center um, to help industry and others to sort of address particular scientific problems. So some of the advantages and disadvantages that we see of um, this particular model, um, when it comes to data publication and reuse, there's no financial barriers in the way to data deposition and publication. 
but there are some restrictions on the use of the public services. So we're not allowing that systematic search over the aggregated collection. But it's important to stress in all this that all the data sets are freely available on an individual basis for anyone to use for whatever purpose they want. But this can lead to some challenges with public perception. There'll be some academic communities who see us as a mainly commercial organisation and will be critical of that. Um, I think when that uh, criticism is put forward constructively it's a useful challenge and you know debate around openness has challenged us to think about how we can involve the public services to make things more freely available. The flip side of this is industry communities don't always appreciate our mission-driven non-profit status and you know, expect us to behave in a way that is more kind of conducive to a sort of more commercial um, organization. And you know, we have to strike a balance here between sort of like, you know, not making sure we don't get too commercial in our approach to this and, and keep in mind that we are here primarily to serve communities worldwide. When it comes to the data quality of the data and um, the curation activities. I think because we have to develop services that have practical application in industry and beyond, it makes us think about what is the most important thing we have to do when it comes to enriching and developing the sort of data itself. So there are benefits there. And the other advantage is that as the organizations evolve, we've been able to draw on expertise in data, software and science to sort of think about how we can generate value and revenue. Thinking about how um, the uh, organization is growing and the future, um, I've, I've alluded to a little bit that we're getting this growing revenue from consultancy activities that draw on our expertise. Some of these are just one-off projects, but with some industry partners, we have quite a profound relationship um, that's quite tied into their um, scientific activities. We've been increasingly engaging in um, industry-led grant funded activities. Um, some of these might be consortia we put together, but um, there's been a couple of major ones where it's a combination of several industry partners and academic partners. Now these don't always add to the bottom line because sometimes we have to contribute to those as well, but they do provide opportunities to develop new products and services that we wouldn't otherwise be able to. Um, we can continue to build and manage our funds to support change. We can draw on our research and development fund to say, for example, invest in improving our infrastructure. I guess in other organizations, you might have to go out and get project specific funding to do that. We have that ability to draw on our own reserves. And this whole model is kept under periodic review with our board of trustees who are a big part of our governance to make sure that it is serving the needs of user communities and open science goals. And I should have added there while staying sustainable. So I just wanted to reflect back on some of the sort of community activities that have gone on around sustainable research data repositories. Um, some of you will be aware of a report that was published by the OACD in 2017, which surveys a lot of the aspects that we'll be talking about today. Uh, one of the things here it says here is that a successful business model has to align with a repository's mission. And I think over the years, we've managed to stay true to that, because if you look at what our charitable aim is, it is all around high quality information services and software, and those are very much at the heart of how we generate our revenue today. And the other thing I wanted to reference was the principles for open scholarly infrastructures developed by Jeff Builder, Jennifer Lynn, and Cameron Nalen, first published back in 2015. And they highlighted aspects around governance, sustainability, and insurance. And if you look at what they say about sustainability, they talk about using time-limited funds only for time-limited activities, having a goal to generate a surplus, building um, contingency, mission consistent revenue generation and generating that revenue based on services, not data. And if you look at the sort of services they put forward, it's value added services, it's consulting, um, it's API service level agreements, which isn't something we've got into. But as we get into an increasingly data driven age, that might be something we want to consider. And I think again, the CCDC model aligns quite nicely with that too. And so that takes me through to the end of my presentation and I hope I've been able to convey through that how our model was sort of evolved over the years to enable sustainable access to research data and knowledge um, throughout a 55 year um, time period and um, look forward to hearing the rest of the talks and joining in the discussion later on.